Good afternoon. It's great to have you all here. Well, as Derek said, we want to welcome you to the second of our semi-annual semi leadership series, a new series called Leaders, Ways, and Wisdom. Um, as Derek said, the uh, idea and the um, actual event was uh, a product of the Dean's Advisory Council, a wonderful group of students who I have the pleasure of working with. Um, this event creates an opportunity for um, our students to hear about the career paths and the leadership experiences and really the reflections as people look back on uh, their journeys through their careers to share those things with our students, um, give our students the opportunity to um, maybe better understand the kinds of opportunities that are available to them in the world, the kinds of visions that will lead you to the places that you want to go, um, and also a, really an opportunity for you to ask them some questions, maybe some personal thoughts uh, you have uh, about you know, how one makes their way in the world when they lead. Um, the people that we invite to speak are our most successful alumni. And as such, they are extraordinarily busy individuals. And so we're extremely appreciative of the time they carve out of those schedules to come and share with us. And I think that it couldn't be more true of anyone than our speaker today who actually moves back and forth across the ocean on a regular basis in doing business. So it's my pleasure today to introduce to you Frank Watoon. Frank began his career in insurance in 1970 and has since founded or operated three of the top 20 insurance brokerage firms in the U.S. He currently serves as the chairman of Cooper Gay Sweat and Crawford Limited, the largest independent global wholesale reinsurance broker. Cooper Gay Sweat and Crawford is headquartered in London and has offerings in 16 countries and a turnover of 400 million. Previously, Mr. Watoon was the founder, president, and CEO of Accordia Insurance Brokers, which went public in 1993 and was sold to Wells Fargo in 2001. He then assumed the role of chairman for Wells Fargo Insurance Services, a retail insurance broker with 168 offices in the U.S. and revenues of $1.5 billion. Mr. Watoon has served in a number of professional organizations, including the Board of Directors at eBenex Incorporated, the Board of Directors for the London Business School, and on UW-Whitewater's Global Business Resource Center Cabinet. He also served on the board of our UW-Whitewater Alumni Association, and he was our 2006 Whitewater commencement speaker. Mr. Watoon obtained his bachelor's degree in UW-Whitewater and earned his MBA in finance from St. Mary's University. Throughout his career, he has been involved in mergers and acquisitions of small, medium, and large cash flow companies, most of which are private and family-owned. His 37-year career path has taken him from Whitewater to London and many places throughout the world. He continues to be actively engaged at the highest levels in global business, and we are very fortunate that he is with us today to share his leadership ways and wisdom. Please join me in welcoming Frank Watoon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm really just thrilled to be here. Um, when one gets a chance to come back to their alma mater, uh, even if it's uh, 40 years later, it's a thrill. And if one is lucky enough to be asked to speak uh, to the students, uh, it's even a bigger thrill. So I really am appreciative not only of being asked to, to spend some time with you, but also the fact that you've taken time out of your day uh, to come listen to an old gray-haired guy talk. Uh, <clears throat> I think I, I want to sort of just share a conversation uh, with you that, that would give, will give you some insight into the kind of, um, the kind of journey I took but hopefully in some way the kind of journey uh, you might find open to you. 
I'm going to take this opportunity to shamefully promote uh, an industry that you don't know much about, nor did I when I got involved in it. And one, when most people start talking about it, find it incredibly boring. <laughs> uh, because there are certain elements of this industry that I think all of you might find uh, fascinating and in its own way lucrative. Um, first of all, I will not speak for 45 minutes, even though that's what they said. I, I do give talks a fair amount. Uh, in, in fact, I was in Bogota, Colombia two months ago giving a talk to a group of, of, of people in our operations in, in Colombia. And I can tell you, even people that are paid to listen to me can't listen to me for 45 minutes. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to keep my remarks short, um, talk a little personally if you don't mind because uh, I'm uh, pretty proud of this university and uh, pretty, uh, <clears throat> pretty proud of the fact that uh, I'm a farm kid from Pewaukee, Wisconsin. And uh, hopefully once those remarks have been completed, we'll have a conversation in terms of questions and thoughts and notions you might have. Uh, around some of the few things that I had to say. As I said, my intent is to share a story with you. Uh, I'm going to specifically talk about two of the companies I've been involved with and the industry I've been a part of. Uh, <clears throat> but before I start those remarks, and I'm actually, because even though I'm a bit older, I've always been type A enough the thing that everybody says to me whenever I'm going to speak to a group or anyone, I need to slow down. And so I, if I sound a little halting, it's only because I've been training myself to try to speak a little bit slower and um, rather than rush through a, a lot of thoughts. But before I start, I need to put some remarks in context. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I want to say is that my ability to achieve and be successful uh, basically in a global industry worldwide was a heck of a lot easier to do than it will be for you. Um, think about that for a minute. And I'm going to give you some examples why that's true. I wasn't going to start with this particular context, but I was having lunch today with the chancellor, and he, I wrote it down afterwards, he asked me something, and I will tell you right now, this is a smart thought. He said, I was sitting next to the chancellor at lunch, and he asked me, he said, what is the interaction between capitalism and democracy? And what he was really saying, because we were having a discussion about the fact that we have operations in countries, some are socialist countries, some are communist countries, some are dictatorships. And what he was really saying is, is it harder, is it more difficult? Can you be successful as a capitalist, um, uh, considering the nature of the country that your business is in? And I thought, you know, that was a, re that was a really interesting thing to say. Um, I've listened to a lot of smart people talk about capitalism and, and talk about being successful in business and in, in, in industries. And it got me thinking. So right then I decided to sort of to change the beginning of my remarks. And I'm going to tell you why I, I feel that it's a lot tougher for all of you starting now than it was for me. There is a real discussion that's going on, and I don't mean this in a political sense. I'm talking in an apolitical sense. I'm talking about going out, being successful, building a business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of discussion literally around the world as to whether capitalism is the best system 
There's a discussion that takes place in our country right now, USA. Uh, we were, it's interesting because this country was based on, there's no more capitalist country in the world than the United States, but there's a real serious discussion taking place as to whether in fact that's a positive. And I work and have operations and meet with a lot of people in a lot of other countries. I, I happen to be headquartered in, in the UK and as you all know the UK is uh, if you remember under, under Thatcher, it, it was a very socialist kind of system from an economic standpoint. It then became uh, much more capitalistic and now it's sort of fallen back and there's a, real, there's a real discussion about where it should go. So the first thing I would say is that um, it's going to be tougher uh, no matter where or what you're trying to do. Uh, because there isn't an automatic positive reaction, not only in the USA, but in, in the EC countries and the EU countries. Uh, there's, not a posit there's not an automatic positive reaction to making money, to be profitable, to being a capitalist, to building a business. Um, when I grew up, when I started out, uh, if you were successful enough to do all those things, uh, you were honored. I mean, it was never thought of anything negative. In other words, it was good to be wealthy. It was good to be rich. It was good to be successful. It was good to be businesses that would last long after you died. That's not the case anymore. So, um, so what you have is that part of the environment, that's going to be much more difficult for you as an entrepreneur or you as someone that wants to follow in those kinds of footsteps. Secondly, um, the world's basically in a recession. I mean, uh, we're all broke, right? So basically, whether I'm in France or I'm in Turkey, I was in Istanbul not too long ago giving a talk and, and uh, you know, uh, whether you're in England, I mean, there's no growth. These are countries that just aren't growing anymore, and the United States has become a country with no growth. It's a lot harder to find jobs. It's a lot harder to be successful. It's a lot harder when people aren't buying your products. So, um, you know, it's a different time. I don't want to be negative, but I do want to be realistic and say um, you're going to have a lot tougher time um, because, of those, because of those things. Uh, the, other thing, uh, the other thing that I want to mention, and I, I made some notes so that I, I, I try to remember, is The, co the biggest problem with the global recession we're all in is the lack of growth. Well, that doesn't take much to figure that out, right? But when you're in an economy that grows 1%, 2%, at best 3%, now most of Europe has been in that kind of an economy. Most of Europe's been there for many, many years. That's why there's this high unemployment, which we now have, you know. And, um, and basically what happens is your, the middle class sort of disappears. And so a lot of the countries where we have operations, we don't have a strong middle class. It's happening a bit in the US too, where we don't have a strong middle class. And that all comes to growth and, and, and the vibrance of your economy and whether you can grow again. So. Um, Hopefully, it won't be a permanent situation, but so I, I promise you I'll finish up on a much uh, a more positive note, <laughs> but I would like, but I, I really wanted to start out by saying that um, if you want to be really successful, 
uh, it's just simply going to be tougher f because of your surroundings and what's happened with the economies of the world. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I think there's going to be high unemployment and low growth in most of the uh, Western developed countries for the foreseeable future. So that's something to think about. Um, so all that means is you better have a real passion for what you're trying to do. Because um, unless you have that passion, unless you're going to really work hard and sacrifice, that's the word. Uh, that's a decision you're all going to have to make. Um, it's a journey that's not going to be successful for any of you. With that, um, I want to talk about a couple personal things. Uh, I, as mentioned, was raised in a small town outside of Milwaukee called Pewaukee, and uh, <clears throat> I had uh, parents that uh, were wonderful but were not educated formally, even high school. Um, I had no one in my family that ever went to college. Um, I never saw anybody in a suit or a white shirt or a tie. My family were, and relatives were farmers or factory workers. Um, but I had a dream. I just, um, and it's a funny, it's an odd story, but I'll t take the chance to tell it. As a young person, I looked around and I always read a lot. And I sort of went around the world in books, right? I had traveled all around the world because I just read a lot. And, and I was interested in a lot of different things. And one of the things that, one of the things was, I went and saw a movie. Believe it or not, I saw a movie. And the movie was shot in New York City, and it was in black and white because this was 1958 or something, right? And, and it was about business people. I didn't even know what business people were. But they, they went in these offices, and, and they, um, they went in these offices in these big buildings in New York, and they had these suits on and these ties, and... Um, you know, they seemed to live this wonderful life and they did all these really interesting things with other people and I mean, it's, a, it's sort of an odd thing to decide that you wanted to end up in the corner office and run your own business by seeing a movie, but you know, it's funny what, what triggers something. And from that, I basically decided when I was very young that I not only was gonna go to work, I was gonna get to the corner office I was going to someday own the businesses. Uh, I was going to be the leader and not the follower. Now, I had no reason to think that would logically ever happen to me. Um, I didn't have any idea if I was ever going to get to college. Uh, I, I didn't have any mentors. But I, I had the dream. I just had the dream, and I could never shake it. And so people come up to me, young people come up to me all the time and say, well, you know, what should I do? Um, how should I you know, advance my career? Who should I know? How can I network? Um, and I look at them and give the same answer. Um, it's your dream. It's not mine. You don't want me to tell you what to do. I mean, you need to figure out what you want to do to make your life happy, successful, meaningful. And really, no one else can tell you that. You can listen to other people and hear their journeys and all of that. But it's really an individual, individual thing. So, I got started on my dream in an odd sort of way. Um, the Vietnam War came along and I went in the military. Um, but instead of getting sent to uh, Vietnam, I got sent to Italy with NATO. And I spent three years in Italy, 
Greece, Turkey. I spent my 18th birthday in Greece. And uh, all of a sudden, I knew I wanted to what I always call live in the world, but all of a sudden I was living in the world as a teenager. And uh, it, was a, it was a part of my growth and part of a lesson that I learned. Um, I intuitively knew that it would change my life that I lived and worked in other countries at a very young age. I also knew something that we talk about now, in fact, we talked about it today in our meeting, and that was um, if you, you know, companies have become so much more global, they're so much more interested in, even if they're a domestic company or a regional company, they're so much more interested in in expanding overseas, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what I knew even 30 years ago and 35 years ago is, and I knew it to my core, just is that, and this is before the information age, this is before the internet, this is when foreign countries were really foreign countries, right? I knew we were all gonna be in the same breadbasket. I just intuitively knew in my gut that the world was gonna get incredibly small, incredibly fast. That was a notion that made me a lot of money over the years. And if, if any of you think that, um, let's put it this way, it would be very wrong to think that we do not live in a worldwide economy. I'll tell you a little story, I sold a business I built to Wells Fargo Bank. Now that's a very large bank, um, very prestigious, big retail bank. Uh, I had a little company, so it wasn't, you know, 6,000 employees and they had 56,000 employees, okay? I sold that business to them and I remember sitting down with the CEO at the time, a guy named uh, Gabasevich, and, and he didn't want anything to do with the world, what I call living in the world. It's, you know, they came out of Minneapolis, they were Norwest, they were a regional bank. And he said, you know, we know what we do, we do this, we do that. And I said, well, you know, you, you, know, you bought this business and the truth is the business you bought is international. And he said, well, you don't have offices overseas. I said, well, you don't understand. I said, you know, the... Uh, our clients are all over the world. The insurance companies whose products we sell are all over the world. Uh, the economy is basically all over the world. Uh, you know, I just didn't quite understand why he didn't see the significance of any of that. And interestingly enough, I stayed with that company for many years after I sold the business. And, and over time, they did understand, but it took quite a long time. So there's still, it's interesting, it's, there's, still, there's still people that that don't understand the importance of having, um, having that, that, that gut reaction and feeling at all times that we're a part of something bigger than the state you're in, the city you're in, the country you're in. So it's a good thing to think and keep in mind. Um, as I said, I'm going to share a story with you and I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of the companies I've been involved with and the industry I've been a part of. But as part of sharing this story, I will highlight a few ideas, thoughts, and notions. Uh, by the way, none of them are shattering. Uh, that made me successful, that made my businesses successful, and give you some examples. In fact, uh, I was saying at lunch, most of those notions and thoughts are things you already know, uh, a bit trite and a bit sophomoric, so forgive me. It's just that they work and they're worth thinking about. Because just if a few of you, if just a few of you think about 
one or two of those little things I might mention. Uh, I'll have not wasted your valuable time because I think, I think they are important. Some of the thoughts and notions I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to try to keep the business jargon out of this, except that as part of the story, I need to, I need to talk about capital structure. I'm sorry. Uh, because I want to talk about debt versus equity. And so um, I am going to talk a little bit about that, capital structures of companies. Uh, I want to, I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about the fact that no one owes you success in your industry, your company, or your career. And I'm going to say that again. No one owes you success in your industry, your company, or your career. I'll give you an example. Unless you're willing to lay it all out there in a very competitive world, and that's the marketplace you're in, uh, don't bother taking the journey because you won't make it. Um, when I'm done with my remarks here and this evening, uh, I'm going to jump in a car, I'm going to drive to O'Hare, I'm going to get on a flight at 9.30 and go to Detroit because I need to get in the Eastern Time Zone. I'm going to stay in a hotel, I'm going to get up and be on a 5 a.m. flight to Miami from Detroit so I can be at an 8 o'clock meeting in Miami tomorrow morning. And I'm the chairman of the company. I only give that description because you have to be willing, regardless of your position in a business, to do whatever it takes to create value, to make it successful, or you aren't going to succeed. Uh, equity. I love talking about equity. Uh, some people in this room know me pretty well, and I kind of say what I think. One of the great things about getting old and having been successful is you can kind of say most anything, and it doesn't really affect you. <laughs> so this is one of those things, I'll just warn you. Never be an employee. Don't be an employee. There's nothing good about being an employee. Be a partner, own equity, be the leader. Don't be the follower. Set the strategy, make it your vision, make it your ideas. I found absolutely no satisfaction about, from being an employee. Um, I made a fair amount of money. I had nice bonuses. I found a whole lot of sac satisfaction by being an equity owner. And if there's one place, if you're going to make the kind of effort that I think you're all going to have to make, if any of you are interested in following this path, and by the way, it's a personal choice. God bless. You know, everybody can do what they want to do. I'm just telling you what worked for me and what I did. But if you are going to follow that path, um, don't waste your time as an employee. You've got to always have a position if you're going to be personally, financially successful, and equity is where you're going to find it. Um, you already heard me say this. The other notion is live in the world. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's no other way than understanding you're part of a bigger picture every day that you work, no matter what business you're in. Differentiate from your competitor. I mean, you've heard that many times. One of the companies I did, which I'll talk about, and I will get to talking about those two companies in a second. Um, you know, I basically started a company from scratch, uh, by the way, with other people's money. I call it OPM. Um, but, and they got a lot of the equity, but I got 
a nice big piece. Um, and, but when, you can, when you're lucky enough to have the money to go out and start a company from scratch, your ideas, your strategy, your business model, there's nothing more rewarding in life if it succeeds. <laughs> um, but I did, a few times in my life I've gotten to do that, and that's really, really been rewarding in all the kinds of ways that, that one can think about. Um, and I started an insurance brokerage company, and it became very successful, and started with the first acquisition and went from there. And it, and I, it was at a time when the industry was into the high end of the industry. Um, and I wanted to go to the middle market, but I wanted big market share. And nobody had ever really done that on a national basis. So I built a company called Accordia, which uh, started in 1992. Uh, 91, took it public in 1992. It was in the middle market. We floated it at 12 or 14 dollars a share. The market in 1997, this is during the dot-com boom, for you remember, if you don't have any revenues or profits, we'll value your company at a gazillion dollars. Uh, I had a company that had both those things and it was valued awful because it was in a business that, uh, quote, slow growth. Um, so raised some money and bought it, took it back private at about $42 a share, which isn't bad, you know, considering. Um, then I raised some money and doubled the, tripled the size of its bottom line and sold it to Wells Fargo. Um, and did it all through, really through a strategy that said, I want to be the, well, it's sort of the Walmart strategy. I'm sure I probably stole it. Big fish, small pond, you know? Uh, I went places, I didn't go to the big cities where my competitors were. I met somebody, I met somebody earlier tonight, and I forgot his first name, and he worked with a gentleman whose business I bought as part of Accordia, one of the greatest guys ever. Uh, it was just a thrill to, to hear about him. But it was a company that, I, I went to places like West Virginia, not New York City. Because if I went to New York City, the broker there uh, had huge market share and was huge in size, and I was never going to be able to be a player. I went to West Virginia, and I bought up the three largest businesses in West Virginia. And all of a sudden, I was $70 million in income in West Virginia. So nobody wrote business and in insurance in West Virginia unless they came to my little middle market company. It was like an annuity. So that wasn't a really big notion or big thought, but it, I, was, I had decided to differentiate myself when I started this new company. I didn't want to be like who were the leaders in our industry. These are people like, you won't know the names, but it's not important. Marsh McLennan, Aon, um, uh, Willis, uh, Fredis James, uh, a and A, they all they all were in the big cities. They all wanted the very large clients, and uh, you know we basically went around the United States, and went to Colorado Springs, not Denver. Went to West Virginia, went to uh, Indianapolis, um, just went wherever we could have huge market share, and be focused on the middle market. Very successful business. Uh, when I sold it to Wells Fargo, their payback period. Uh, was five years, and we, they paid a fairly decent price for the company because it's just, it, you know, um, I'm mixing this up a little bit because I, I don't want to get too detailed, but I do want to talk a little bit about the industry. But one of the great things about insurance brokerage, which is the business I'm in, one of the great things is it takes a lot to mess the business up because it takes a lot to move business. If you have a client, and if I'm a broker, I would have a client. Um, and you have a client, I'll give you an example of a client. Um, 
Mexico, our Mexican office, our biggest client in Mexico is Carlos Slim. Some of you may have heard of him. He's the richest man in the world. But he also owns all these telecom companies. He owns oil. He owns, and we write all his business, right? And uh, the average, see the average, it's a, knowing the nuances of business. The, in my business, the average um, period of time that client stays is 12 years. So if you get a dollar's worth of income from that client, you write that client, right? You're really getting $12, you think about it. And that's one of the, the nuances of the business that makes it such a great business. It makes it a business that you can leverage. It makes you to be able to use debt responsibly and reasonably because basically, and that's why banks, they're called mature market businesses, but banks are mature market businesses. They have the same thing. They go out and buy other banks because they, it's internal growth. It's too expensive. And that's true of insurance brokers also. Um, I'm jumping around a little bit, but I, I want to, I really want to make sure we, we get the questions going here. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, I really started, I started getting a job out of Whitewater because after I was done in the military, I had the GI Bill and I came to this institution and, uh, and I graduated in 1970 and I really wanted to be a teacher, a history teacher. I loved to read and I loved history. And uh, I ended up going to work for an insurance company. And I'm going to only mention that because I just want you to take something away. There's nothing more boring than talking about insurance or insurance companies. Uh, they're like talking about banks. They're boring people. They're boring businesses. They're, everybody's interchangeable. Um, there's, uh, there's time and grade in order to be promoted. Um, they're awful. I spent eight years, the worst eight years of my life. And then I figured out that there was another smaller industry as part of the insurance industry called brokers, which really are the people that take the product that the insurance company makes, right? And they basically sell it. They basically have clients and they're there, they manage their risk and they basically place their business with the insurance company for which they get a commission. They're a middleman. Um, they're the ones that for a hundred years people talk about are going to go away and be disimmediated. I made a lot of money knowing that that was never going to happen. These are great businesses. One, one of the so anyway, I, I got out of that, got involved. Uh, I, got, I was involved with a company. I, I went to work for a company called Fred S. James, San Francisco. And um, I, uh, my first client was Intel Corporation, great company, uh, especially great in the late 70s when uh, you know, they were just starting their run up. And, uh, this, and one of the things about being a broker is you get to be intimately involved with your clients. And that's one of the exciting things about working in this business is I knew as much about their business as they knew. And I met the most wonderful people and I dealt with the most uh, you know, terrific smart, smart people. They were a true international company. They had their finance department in Paris. They had their assembly plant in Kuala Lumpur or Penang. They had and I got to travel all these places and I got to do all these interesting things. But I, uh, and I was well paid. I was well paid. I mean, basically, I'm a salesman. I'm in a relationship business. I have clients. I get a percentage of that. My first raise from going to an insurance company to an insurance broker and got Intel as a client, my first raise was $175,000. That taught me something, right? That, that said something, you know? I wasn't going to have to wait 20 years to, you know, to move my way up inside these stodgy, bureaucratic, awful institutions. So, but 
I never forgot the dream I had, the passion I had as a young man, wanting to be the best I could be, to be the person in the corner office. And so, I basically, um, I basically went from being an employee of an insurance broker as a salesperson um, to trying to start my own insurance brokerage business. And what I did was, at that time I was uh, starting to do some work on the corporate side because this was in the days when there weren't a lot of, um, I, by that time I had an MBA and some other uh, degrees thing and there weren't a lot of people like that around. And so I got a chance to, to get involved with the corporate side of the business and I was doing some deals over in Europe uh, where they were trying to expand their business, but I was still keeping my clients. And they got bought, the business got bought, I didn't want to be part of them. So I, I had met some people over there, uh, Berkeley Gavette in London. I, I got them to put up some money, and I started a company called Berkeley Insurance Brokers, specializing in high-tech clients. They owned 70%, I owned 30%. In one year, um, I didn't build it very big, but in one year I sold it back to the company that I used to work for. And um, wow, I made a lot of money. And I, I really, that really said to me that it's all about equity. It's all about being able to make a difference at that level. It's all about leadership. It's all about not following. So. And that basically then is what I have been doing um, ever since. I uh, did Accordia after I did, I did uh, Accordia, I did uh, Financial Guardian in Kansas City. Um, uh, I've told you the story of Accordia. Uh, it's still a very successful business now called Wells Fargo Insurance Services. Uh, six years ago, I, uh, Six years ago, I was chairman of the insurance division, the whole division of Wells Fargo Insurance, uh, but I was totally bored. And I went to the, uh, then the CEO of the bank who owned the company and I said, um, you know, I just really want to retire and leave. And, and he said, well, uh, we'd like you to stay around a while, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I need to continue to work. I just I don't need to sit in a big office and I just, you know, the business is doing well under you and I want to leave. And so they said, well, will you stay, but you can go work, but you can't work in the U.S. So basically about that time, as luck would have it or whatever, I was recruited by a, re a headhunter in London to get involved with a small reinsurance broker worldwide, but headquartered in London uh, and uh, wholesale wholesale broker, Lloyd's broker, um, and I went to work for them, and Wells Fargo allowed me to do that. So I've been now six years with a company called Cooper Gay, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Cooper Gay and then we're done, and that is um, they were about $75 million in revenue. I, I didn't know a lot about the wholesale reinsurance business, but what I've learned is they're the brightest people I've ever met in the industry. They basically, um, they call it bespoke in, uh, in, in the UK, but they, they basically write contracts uh, individually for clients. When clients get to be a certain size, and our big clients are mostly in energy in Cooper Gay. Uh, we do uh, Petavesta, we do all the big oil companies throughout the world. They're all written through Cooper Gay. It's because they have strong enough balance sheets. They have strong enough uh, finances that they don't need insurance companies. In fact, many times they're 10 times larger than an insurance company where they would get a policy from to protect them. So what they, what they do is they self-insure, and that's where reinsurance comes in. Uh, they self-insure, but at a certain level, um, they want uh, somebody else to share the risk. And these are... You have to really know the business. You have to really know technically um, and, and financially how to put these things together. And, and they're totally global. Um, 
Cooper Gay is in um, 40 countries, uh, has a client list to die for, but they were about 70 million with a bunch of East Enders, really bright Londoners, and it was kind of a, what I used to call a comfortable company. Um, they brought me in because they knew I built businesses and so forth, and they wanted, the CEO really wanted to get that business to the next level, and it was incredibly successful, 75 million in revenue, turnover, 35% margins, uh, great business, lifestyle business. You know, your CEO, the employees own the company, uh, you know, you're living pretty well. But I give him a lot of credit. He wanted more. He wanted something that would be there forever or long after he was gone. And he wanted better for the people that work for the company. And you only do that through growth. So he brought someone like me in. I call myself the token American. And uh, as I said, equity is number one, right? So if, he brought, if they're going to bring me in, I don't want a salary. I want a piece of the company. And if you're not willing to give me the piece, I'm not coming. It's a waste of my time. And um, they were nice enough to share a little bit with me. And so I came to work for them six years ago. We're now about 400 million. Um, and we've, we've got a vision that will, I think, allow us to float the company yet this year. And, um, and when, I, when I spend time with, with the people that I work with, the people in all the different offices in all the different countries, um, they, all, they all just have a future so much better than they had before. And, you know, I'm very, very, very proud of that. So, in conclusion, um, I jumped around a bit and I surely didn't cover everything as clearly as I set out to. But I would, I would really encourage all of you to dream big, to be whatever you think you can be, to understand some of the things you need to think about as you go forward. And to put yourself on a path that if you are going to make the kind of sacrifices required, it's going to mean something to you personally, to your family, to your business, to your employees. And with that, I'd love to listen to anything you all would have to say. Thank you. All right. Uh, if any of you have any questions, feel free to Nima. Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for mentioning the international business, actually, and that there are different economic styles out there that they are really working fine. Because I put it in my paper, my, one of my papers, I was, I was penalized for that. Because, like, you know, no, our system is the best, so blah, 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 blah. So uh, s my question is actually, I uh, wanted to know one of the best opportunities that you found out there, like in international business. So one of those that you really think that was a big one, a big opportunity that you, you, you just got there, as uh, an example. I, I, Thank uh, you. If you're talking about economies, um, I'm... Uh, I actually had to leave a lunch to because I was I'm closing something and we had a special board meeting on the phone to do it. I think one of the one of the best future economies is Turkey. Uh, I'm real bullish on Turkey uh, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, I'm, uh, we're our company biggest strength Cooper Gay is in South America, the Latin countries, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Peru. That's where we're getting all our internal growth from. 
Because again, these are businesses that are not high internal growth businesses, but we get a lot of internal growth from that. Turkey, I see as the, the next big, the big breakthrough. And we're gonna have an operation there. That's again a personal opinion. Well, I want to thank you, Frank, for, for being really forthcoming and also being very personal and, you know, saying the things that really meant something to you about how you made your way in the world. But, you know, when I'm listening, I'm listening from a personal perspective, too, and I'm thinking about equity. And when you originally said equity, my thought was, well, it could be financial equity, it could be other kinds of equity, but you, you've got to have a stake. So, and I don't, I don't have any equity here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess my taxes would be part of the equity. So, I mean, can you just talk a bit more about that? Were you include? Were you thinking of equity other than financial, or s sincerely, you think that's the way to go? Um, I, I'm an unapologetic capitalist, and I was thinking of equity, totally in the financial sense. And and I say that there clearly are careers and things that will be very satisfying, make you all very happy, and and y y you know. I'm just talking about if you decide to go down a path of building businesses and industries and those kinds of things, is don't waste your time if you're going down that path. If you're looking, if you're looking to become one of the dreaded 1%, uh, you know, you're gonna only do it with equity. You're not gonna do it, you're not gonna do it working for anybody. Uh, but I, that's a choice. I mean, there's plenty of, like I say, I think if I could have gotten a job as a school teacher, um, I may have never, you know, I, I, there, you know, I just, uh, I, I just found that a lesson to talk to people about. If they're going to go into business and they're going to do things, and they've got a passion about what they want to do, then damn it, don't be an employee. Just don't be an employee. Figure out a way not to be. And listen, if I can do it, you know. One thing I didn't say, but I really, I'm sorry, I, sh I meant to say, I competed, I still compete all over the world. In fact, the last speaker at this series was a big competitor of mine. Uh, yeah. Uh, Michael Halloran. When I knew Mike, we both went to Whitewater. And when I knew, and talk about a small world. Michael Halloran was a president of Aon, when I was the CEO of Accordia. We were competitors. I was headquartered right across the street in Chicago from him. Um, we both went to Whitewater. In fact, the president at that time of Marsh McLennan was a guy that graduated, which is the biggest broker in the world, by the way, insurance broker, was a guy that graduated from Stevens Point. My only, my only thing I'm trying to say is, I competed successfully. Now look, I, I did get a, an MBA, I did postgraduate work at both Wharton and Harvard. Having said that, having said that, I competed with my whitewater background as well as anybody you'd ever meet. So one thing I have not ever done, and I'm blessedly thankful for to this day, is I got educated at this establishment. It's a good school. Don't ever be embarrassed about you know, I sit in boardrooms in London. I'm, you know, I'm around a lot of people from a lot of Ivy League schools. I know a lot of them. A lot of them work for me. But I'm just telling you, <laughs> don't ever, ever, ever feel ashamed that you went to this university. One of the best. One of the best. All right. Are there any more questions? Okay, I have one of my own then. Uh, I've been waiting for this chance. Uh, so in your speech, you mentioned uh, managing your risk, and recently China's debt was downgraded. Uh, has Asia mismanaged its risk over the years, and will their considerations as the new emerging economies, the power, the economic powers of the world maintain, be maintained, or will that slip away from them and go maybe to Turkey, like you were saying? Um, I don't think it's an either-or thing with Turkey and China. I don't think Turkey will ever compete with China on the basis you're, this, you, you, you're talking about it. Um, uh, you know, it's, 
you can't compare economies exactly. And so you, when I started out with the little depressing news that things are going to be a lot tougher because the world's basically in a depression or a recession, um, I just wanted to say that because I'm kind of a direct speaking guy and that's what you're going to have to deal with. But having said that, you know, we got our issues now, high unemployment, low GDP growth, but we are a huge economy. And you know, when I buy businesses or you know, involve with businesses in all these other countries, including Turkey, you know, half the time these countries have an economy of Vermont. I mean, you have to understand the scale and the size. The one difference is China. China has, if they can keep their currency under control, I mean, uh, you know, China is one heck of an economy at this point. Um, and just like the U.S. is, it's, it's got terrific size. Russia's got size. It's not ever going to be one heck of an economy because it basically has a system of government that doesn't support capitalism, ability to make money. It has no infrastructure. The legal system is awful. The, uh, you know, so you know, the, all this stuff means, means something. But I, no, I think China... I think China is going to be uh, a world-class power uh, economically for many, many years. I also think the U.S. will too. I mean, I, you know, we'll, we'll get through all of this at some point. Um, hopefully the middle class will come back. The growth in the economy will come back. Um, you know, interest rates will come back. You know, having zero interest rates is not normal. <laughs> I mean, you know, never happened before. Six years with no interest rates. Uh, what do you do? I mean, that sounds great if you got a lot of debt, which we do, so you don't have to pay, you know, you don't have to raise taxes to pay, but, but truthfully, that's not really capitalism. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Mr. Watoon? All right, well, well thank you for thank your time. Thank you again. <laughs>